Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Lessons from 10 Years of Growth-Driven Web Design. My name is Chris Jorgensen. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Unleash Technologies. For those of you who do not know us already, Unleash Technologies has been dedicated to creating award-winning websites and digital experiences for our clients since 2007. We have a particular focus on open source web technologies with our primary platforms being Drupal and WordPress. Growth-driven design is a topic that has recently been top of mind for many of our clients and has gained mainstream awareness primarily through HubSpot. So we decided to put together today's webinar as an intro to the subject. At this time, I'll be turning things over to Chris Foran, Director of Growth here at Unleash Technologies. Chris is certified in growth-driven design by HubSpot and has over a decade of experience working with organizations to achieve their goals online. Chris, take it over. Thanks so much, Chris, and thanks, thank you all for joining us here today. Um, we are uh, happy to be talking about a very exciting topic, uh, growth-driven design. And uh, also want to encourage you to uh, ask questions throughout the session. We, we have some Q&A at the end, but if you wanted to chat questions to us during the session, I'm a big fan of, of engaging in the moment. So we definitely will, will answer your questions on the spot if, if possible. So just a quick, um, you know, Chris did a great job introducing us. Just a quick little extra bit about Unleash Technologies and one of the the reasons we are promoting a growth-driven approach to web design is the success that we've had. Uh, we're currently ranked the number one web design and development company in both Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, and that is based on client satisfaction reviews. So Unleashed Technologies, the main metric we track is, is client satisfaction. So everyone can talk about awards and, and other things like that, but it's really what your clients are saying about you, and that's something you'll, you'll learn more about today. Speaking of which, I uh, wanted to give you a quick overview of what we're covering today. So the purpose of today's call is not to attempt to teach you all of the principles of growth-driven design. You know, it's a methodology that goes pretty deep, um, but it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward, but we'd rather share our experience working in a very similar fashion for the past 10 years. You know, we're a hub, nowadays we're a HubSpot certified partner in growth-driven design, and we have adopted some of the elements of HubSpot's approach, but like any methodology, when you're able to test and learn and, and find out what makes you successful, uh, it takes time. And we've been taking a very similar approach over the last 10 years, and we're excited to share a little bit about that. So, so at Unleashed Technologies, our passion is creating, enhancing, and managing award-winning websites and digital experiences. You know, our core services, digital strategy, web design and development, e-commerce solutions, and then inbound marketing something we added recently at becoming a HubSpot partner agency, making you know, our growth-driven design approach official, official as we're certified with HubSpot. So what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about our story and our, our growth-driven approach to web design. Um, just for uh, reference sake, uh, we have uh, over 40 active clients with us on growth-driven programs. Um, our clients run the gamut from higher education, associations, a lot of experience in the association space, as well as uh, commercial manufacturing and financial services. Wanted to provide you all with one quick disclaimer uh, as we, we start talking about this. Unleashed Technologies did not invent growth-driven design, <laughs> nor are we making that claim. We've taken a very similar approach, like we said, over the past 10 years, but we don't like to make any grandiose claims like Mr. Al Gore did a few years back. So speaking of which, um, the principles that growth-driven design are based on, because as you know, HubSpot didn't invent this approach. It's a, it's a combination of a lean and agile approach to web design. And, and really, it started with lean manufacturing uh, by Toyota back in, I believe, the early 60s, a gentleman by the name of Taiko Ono, who came up with the content concept of lean and essentially what it was in the manufacturing world is a system and philosophy that is now used by many manufacturers throughout the world and many engineers throughout the world and the emphasis is to cut out the fat or waste in the manufacturing process so according to tai, tai Chi waste is defined as anything that does not add value to the customer so 
kind of think about that as we talk about growth driven design and and what goes into the building of a website and specifically uh, uh, an MVP website a minimally viable product you know think about the, the things that are only adding value to the customer as you as you take your website online so uh, mr. Ono uh, was responsible for really you know taking Toyota to the next level selling I believe 30 million automobiles in the United States and, and Japanese uh, automobiles really taking over the market for a good stretch. So that success um, actually translated into uh, the world of manufacturing outside of the automobile marketplace, but also uh, engineers in general, specifically software engineers, were, were adopting this, this lean approach, which was kind of evolving into a more agile approach. And, and back in 2001, a group of software engineers came up and actually created a manifesto around agile software development. And um, again, what you'll see here are a lot of things that are um, being combined in the growth-driven design philosophy. And, and some of the, the core elements here are early and continuous software delivery. So getting to launch quickly and testing things, um, allowing you to change your mind. So welcoming change requirements in the process based on things that you learn from actually launching a website sooner rather than later. Um, delivery working, so, deliver working software frequently. So getting those new enhancements out quickly and getting them tested so you can uh, cooperate with your team. You can um, make those changes that are gonna be impactful going forward. So when you think about software or you think about websites, you're, you're really adapting to what you learn uh, over time. And it's this process of continuous improvement, really. And there's a Japanese word for it, Kaizen, which means change good. And uh, the other critical pieces of this, I'm not gonna take you through this entire manifesto right now, would be communication is critically important. Um, to make it sustainable, you've gotta keep this constant pace. You just like exercise or if you're working um, to make any change over time, you have to be consistent with these small continuous changes, okay? So that leads us to today where HubSpot and a gentleman by the name Luke Summerfield at HubSpot was tasked with coming up with a more creative way for people to get better results from their websites. And, and it's really, again, based on this premise that a website doesn't have a beginning and an end. It's never finished. And you really should treat it that way and you should commit to the continuous improvement of your website. So according to Luke Summerfield at HubSpot, growth driven design is a smarter approach to web design that limits all of the headaches and, and drives optimal results using data. So we'll talk a little bit about how this came about and, and why there was a need for this. And, and really that's why uh, it, it relates exactly into why Unleashed Technology exists. We were really born out of this need for growth driven design. So what we'd like to do is take a quick flashback to 2007. Unleashed Technologies is born. So that's when our company was introduced. Uh, and basically was, we started out as the need for a better approach to web design. Uh, you think about what happened in 2007, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone. Hard to think about that really. It seems like the iPhone has been part of our lives forever at this point, but that was a little over 10 years ago. U.S. housing bubble burst, uh, Barack Obama campaigns to be the next U.S. president. And, you ha and on the right here, you had Britney Spears, um, who's co also come a long way since, since 2007. So the, the, the key uh, commonality here amongst these things is the change was in the air. And uh, uh, you know, small changes over time add up to big, big results in the future. So why was all these technologies created? Why do we exist? Quite frankly, our founders were, uh, there's no sugar coating. Our founders were out there, went out to hire some web developers for previous business experience, and it was terrible. Um, they equate it to being on par with hiring a contractor to repair your house. People got to the point with web designers that they would assume they were going to have a bad experience, and if it went well, they, they were pleasantly surprised. So Unleashed Technology was founded on the premise that there, there had to be a better way, and there had to be a service that provides that people could provide a service of web design and development that um, was a better experience and produced better results. So we exist because web design companies sucked. The reason they sucked was because they were project driven. Think about it back in the day, this this website we're looking at right here, Unleashed Technologies 
did not build this, but but web a web company would take some requirements and they would disappear for six months and then come back with something to show you and it was really far off what you were hoping. And as a result of poor communication or no communication during that process, um, um, what they delivered, if they actually delivered something, was very different from what they hoped for and had in mind. So often it entailed a large upfront investment, uh, you know, go safe to say or unreliable results or no results at all. And, and when this project approach to website design, there's no option to change your mind. It was a set it and forget it approach. You launched your site and three years later, this was, um, you were possibly thinking about another redesign and you made no ch changes during that time period. So don't mean to belabor the point, but at least technologies felt we could do a better job. And I think it's important to understand you know why why we thought so so as we talk a little bit more about why unleashed technologies exist you can get a little sense for our culture here and what we've evolved to um, i was trying to think of the perfect analogy for why traditional website projects fail and i had to look no farther than the uh, conference room that i'm sitting in for inspiration so unleashed technologies you'd say we're a little obsessed with star wars and and here's some actual photos of our conference rooms and you'll see that we balance each off with both good and evil. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to make a Star Wars analogy. I would say if you do try to quiz me on Star Wars, I will probably fail. But I, I definitely encourage you <laughs> to shoot me some, some growth different design questions. But, but here it goes. So think about the, the, in history the, some of the highest profile cases of failed projects. Um, here we have the Death Star. You know, similar to what we were just talking about. The Death Star was built based on assumptions. It was a pet idea of the emperor. Um, it had insufficient re project requirements. It went over budget. Uh, there's actually, as much as we are Star Wars nerds here, uh, someone actually calculated the cost of building an actual <laughs> uh, Death Star, and they said in today's dollars, it would cost $22 quadrillion to build a Death Star. So. Again, as much as we're nerds here, that someone took it to a different level making that calculation. But the point being is that the, the Death Star went way over budget and timeline based on insufficient project requirements. You know, the Death Star was meant to be the ultimate weapon. And in that sense, it succeeded. You know, a super laser capable of destroying a planet with a single blast. And it filled those requirements, but the plans only considered offensive measures. So it, it, it failed to imagine the need for a real defense. And, and we all know what happened. Um, the, the defenses were not tight enough to prevent the star fighters from infiltrating and causing catastrophic damages, which, which we all know what happened to the uh, Death Star. But just real quick, finishing out the, um, the, the reasons the Death Star failed, and these are all the same reasons the project failed as it relates to a, a website is, you know, failure to recognize or manage that risk, no testing before launch, not being able to conceptualize what your vulnerabilities might be, uh, poor collaboration and communication. In the case with the Death Star, it was, you know, dealing with evil dictators like the, the Emperor or uh, Darth Vader. But you'll see as we talk about our approach, communication and collaboration is critical to succeeding on these pro projects, as also it is to learn from your mistakes and, 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 you know, fail on purpose sometimes to know what is going to inform the right, right way to do things. Unfortunately, they didn't, the Empire didn't do that. They, they didn't learn from their mistakes and we, uh, they launched Death Star 2. Again, same result. So what would be the better approach? So on these technologies, I was saying, we formulated a better approach. We built our agency based on the premise that your website is never finished. You know, to be competitive, to be successful out there, you need to commit to the continuous improvement of your website. What that means is making frequent, impactful changes to your site. And by default, as an agency, we have to communicate more with our clients each week, in fact. And that allows our clients to change their minds. It could be very early in the design process or, or anywhere in the process. We actually encourage them to do so because we want to catch those changes and adapt and make make things catch things early before we launch and then once we do launch quickly um, learn from that so we're committing to that continuous improvement 
constant communication with clients, and then client satisfaction as the primary measure of success. And, and the way that we do that is we partner with them on their goals. So digging into some of the, you know, the specifics of growth-driven design, just on a very high level, you know, here you are, the traditional project-based website redesign. And this is probably familiar to a lot of you folks who have ever been through a redesign. You know, the, you wait two years, and then you take three months to go through the process of a, maybe an RFP, and you find someone, and then the actual website project, a lot of times, depending on the size of the organization, is going to take at least three months to redesign. And, and that's when you're making impactful changes to the site. You know, really, I think there's a survey out there that says um, by HubSpot that 42% of marketers only make two to three impactful changes a year. So they're missing out on a very significant opportunity that comes with making more frequent, impactful changes. And we'll demonstrate that here. So in contrast, the growth-driven approach, you're, you know, you're, you're actually making, you know, working with a, a group like ours and the, the, one, the approach that we've taken with our clients, we meet with them weekly. We're delivering work on a weekly, sometimes semi-monthly basis to deliver work and get feedback from the customers and then make, um, really prioritize what are gonna be the most impactful changes we can make to the website at that point in time. And when you have all these touch points over the course of, in this case, four years, it's gonna have a compounding effect on your results over time. Think about the compounding value of money, you know, investing, uh, you know, <laughs> drip campaigns. I come from the investment world originally you know your, your money adds up over time similarly these little changes or little adjustments to the steering wheel are going to really um, factor in real client engagements real data they're going to improve the customer experience and they're going to improve your results so the growth driven design approach really has three stages the strategy stage the minimally viable product launch pad website where you, you get your site out very quickly you know, back to um, the gentleman at, at Toyota, you know, let's, let's find out what are the requirements, what, what, do, what do we need exactly to add value to the customers and nothing more than that. That's what we want in our minimally viable product. Anything over and above that, we are going to based on what we learn from interactions from the customers and the data that we gather after we launch. So after the MVP, the, the launch pad, we then are in basically continuous improvement for <laughs> perpetuity, potentially, in, in, if, you are, if you have set the right foundation for your website and you've kind of built something that's going to help you future-proof as much as possible. So again, these are the, the strategies on, on the highest level. As far as Unleashed Technologies goes, what makes it successful is knowing what our clients' goals are. So those, those iterations that we looked at here each and every week or, or a couple times a month, if we have documented the, their key goals, the four to six KPIs as we call them here, and every decision we make goes into it or, or relates back to us working towards those goals, every change we make to the website is gonna be based on what's most impactful in achieving those goals. So key system attributes, when you think about it, these are the requirements or the what type of functionality needs to go into the website. So we call them KSAs. Um, how are we going to accomplish goals? So what system attributes, in this case, what functionality do we need to add to the website that's going to help us achieve those goals? If it's something, if you're adding something to your site and it's not attached to goals, it's, it's really just either slowing your site down or making it more um, harder to navigate and, and, and more information. So overall, the, this measurability, you can't, um, you can't track what you don't measure. So all of this is going to be dependent on not only knowing what those goals are, but benchmarking them in the beginning, tracking those goals, and sharing results on a frequent and regular basis in, 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 a, in a very um, high communication model. So, you know, some more specifics on the Unleashed Growth Model. So for us, we position ourselves as a true partner and extension of our client's team. So really right now in this economy uh, and this marketplace, we're experiencing a lot of medium to large size organizations uh, building up their internal web and marketing capabilities. You know, that said, you, you'll always have some gaps in skill sets and you'll be limited 
to your own internal perspective. So working with an external partner of, of specialized and certified experts, you can essentially augment your team and get an extension of your team driving growth. And, and they're making prescriptive recommendations based on them being experts and based on insights from data. Now, this is this isn't easy to achieve. You know, I think the thing is here that we'll talk about is, you know, we've we've shown results, but a lot of people talk about being able to be a true extension of their clients. And but it's again the metric for us that's going to really matter above all and else is, is that client satisfaction. And luckily nowadays we have a way to track it in the form of client reviews. Also critical to this process is the constant contact. It's not the, not that we use the term here. It's not the email platform. This is just constant communication with our team and using some sort of uh, software like we do with Teamwork. You actually have full access to everyone on that team. So starting to say we work in pods, you work with a company like ours, you've, you've got uh, an entire web team, project manager, digital strategist, marketing manager, solutions architect, you know, you start to add up what it would cost to build this team on your own side, um, it would be very costly. But even if you, maybe you have two or three of these roles, you can balance out and fill the gaps on your end and work with a team over time that is really going to get to know you and, and have your best interest in mind. And really, the feedback we've gotten is that, you know, our team treats the website as if their own. So it's, so it's really the in the past, the transactional nature of web projects made it really difficult for this to happen. Like just for the time, by the time that they were getting to know someone, the project ended or the customer got upset and walked away or there was turnover with the project manager and, and they had to start over. So this is something that has made us successful. The communication is critical to it. And really the benefits um, that I've, that we've seen are as follows. Um, client retention. So with Unleash Technologies, the average client tenure is five to seven years. And, and taking this approach with um, our clients renewing with us on a service level agreement annually, we have an active client roster of over 40 growth package clients. And, and they would not renew with us if we were not um, delivering results for them. The other critical piece here is that by not having by having predictable revenue in the form of, of client retainers who pay us monthly to to work with us for their continuous improvement for their growth packages, we don't have the ups and downs that most agencies have in the forms of, of of revenue problems. Most agencies have to hire up or staff down in order to uh, keep keep their profits up. So we have that predictable revenue. We've never had a layoff, and we have 40 employees here with an average tenure of about five years with Unleashed Technologies. So at the end of the day, it all equates to happier clients. And, and that's not us saying that our clients are happier. That's us being ranked number one in client satisfaction in both DC and Baltimore for web design and development and globally. So really, when we talk about the benefits of growth-driven design, we want to talk about the benefits of, of taking this approach as an agency, but also understanding that it is uh, it is this continuous improvement and this you know this trust and this this expertise that needs to exist to make it all happen. So it's so it's not easy. <laughs> Oftentimes you, you may need a partner, or um, there are great resources out there which I will put in the um, in the slides and we post online as for as far as the sources that you can refer to as it relates to uh, growth driven design and lastly you know HubSpot has a free certification for you to go through and get certified in this it's probably a, a three-hour course but I, I, I highly recommend it um, it's it's very useful knowledge if, if you're working in this space and I encourage you to reach out to us if you'd like to dig a little deeper and, and find out if it's a it's a right solution for your business so that said, um, I think I probably sprinted through this content. I tend to talk a little fast, but wanted to open up the floor to questions and see if anyone had any uh, questions on the material. So, Chris, we do have a few questions already lined out. If you'd like to ask a question, feel free to use the um, functionality on GoToMeeting just to type that in, and I'll be happy to uh, pose it to Chris here. So, a few already in the bucket here. Uh, 
Stephen would like to know, is growth-driven design more costly than a traditional project-based approach? Uh, that's a good question. So I probably should preface this, and I'm not sure if I maybe covered it properly in the um, presentation, but growth-driven design is a monthly investment um, that you make each and every month towards your website, as opposed to that fixed investment that uh, people made in web projects. Now, we know that those web projects very frequently went over budget and over time. So what looks like on paper could potentially cost you more usually doesn't, but, but what I would also say is that there's a shift going on nowadays where a lot of marketers are, are incorporating growth-driven design into their, their budgets for you know, the, the continuous engagement, the improvement of that customer experience each and every month as opposed to that one-time investment every two years. So I think if you were to look at it, uh, you know, annually, will your, would you need to increase your, your allocation to your, your web design and your development? Yes, I would, be, I would say it would probably be incrementally more on an annual basis, but also the, that ROI equation is there. If you think about what the, the effect that those more frequent, regular, impactful changes will have um, you can make that case that you're going to vastly improve the customer experience and the results you get from your website. Sorry, a long-winded answer to your question, but more expensive, but definitely worth the investment. Yeah, and I think just to piggyback on that would be the, the missed opportunity, right, in terms of waiting every two years for that next iteration and those improvements that, you know, while you're waiting those two years, the marketplace and your competitors have already moved ahead. Oh, absolutely. And that's that's the thing. It's you're, you're, you're adapting, you know. I think... Uh, I think it was Pete Rose said they should, the name, it shouldn't be called baseball, it should be called adjustments. He was constantly adjusting his swing at the plate and he was the hit king and I'm a big sports fan, but same thing, you know, you're, for you to stay competitive and compete, keep putting up the highest batting average, you've got to be making that commitment to those continuous uh, impactful changes based on what you learn from your, your clients. Chris, our next question comes from Sarah and she says, do you need HubSpot in order to take a growth rate? design approach to your next project? So another great question. You know, HubSpot has done a really good job in kind of branding growth-driven design. Again, we, as we saw today, hopefully, it's, it's nothing new. They kind of are combining some, some principles that are around for decades. But no, you wouldn't need HubSpot um, to do that. What you do need and what HubSpot does is a, is a central hub to collect all of your customer engagements with with your web properties. So you, you, you need a customer database. You need to have tracking tools in place. You need to be able to collect customer data. The more you know about your customers, the better you can make that customer experience, the more impactful changes you can make on a monthly basis. You know, HubSpot does a good job of bringing those things together, but there's a lot of different um, tools out there that, that might potentially get you to the same place. Yeah, and I would just say in terms of education, and you really, I think did a great job of explaining this, but HubSpot, they branded it, but they also, in terms of resources and free resources at that, you know, whether it's their certification, which is totally free, or all just the documentation and blog posts around this subject, great starting point for anyone, whether they use HubSpot as, as their marketing automation tool right. or not, you know, definitely a great place to start. So I am a I am a very loyal, <laughs> brand loyal HubSpot person, so to speak. I um. I really like that because, I mean, when you think about it, they're practicing what they, they preach. HubSpot is helping marketers like myself do their job. And the way that they're doing that is with content that makes me better at my job. And that is training. And then also with tools. So they, they, they draw me in with their training and they give me free access to their tools and I'm able to use them properly. And then you know, eventually I end up paying for them as well because I'm, I'm seeing return on investment from them. So yes. Uh, I think it's great to have the, the, the academy alongside with, with, with the tools. Um, HubSpot doesn't make sense for some bigger enterprise organizations on a cost from a cost standpoint. So whether you're using Marketo or um, Salesforce type tools, um, Pardot, uh, you know, you can take this approach. It's, 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 the, it's the methodology, it's the strategy that goes into it. Um, 
but you know, we never lead with tools. We always want to be strategy first and then maybe help you evaluate the right tool to implement that strategy. Chris, our next question comes from Mark. It says, is growth driven design effective for e-commerce solutions and e-commerce websites? Uh, very much so. And I would say um, growth driven design, given the, the transactional nature of e-commerce is even more critical on e-commerce because you are the conversions ideally the conversions on an e-commerce site are are going to be more frequent right so if you are a, say an association or you're a nonprofit or some sort of ad advocacy group you're measuring things like engagement or members um, member value and those types of things on e-commerce e you're really trying to increase sales and conversion and so there's a lot of, you know, part of that continuous improvement is, is A-B testing. So testing different landing pages, te testing different calls to action, testing different messages and emails that go out. So, so growth-driven design is, is, is critical to e-commerce. Our next question comes from Sam. And he says, how do I begin the process of improving user experience at my organization? So... The, the the very first thing that when people ask me this question and it's a it's a good one Sam it's a common question um, you you cannot improve the customer experience unless you have data on your customers so you need to start learning more about your customers you need to start gathering more data you need to start gathering more information so so whether that is you know, implementing some tools or or doing things as simple as, you know, conducting surveys or having interviews with your customers or your members and things like that. So getting to know them and 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 really getting the feedback from them of what they want to see in, in that online experience, what type of information they want, what they want to achieve, then you can start to build your minimally viable product, your launch pad. And then hopefully that launch pad is in a place that has the tools to help you collect and interpret data you collect on an ongoing basis to improve that experience. So it starts with, with knowing your customers. The more you know about them, the better you can make that experience. Yeah, and the one thing I would say is our team has seen in the last two, three years is really a transition from the control of the website being from the CTO or director of IT to the marketing team and the you know, CMO, director of marketing, that, that side of the equation. Um, and I think, you know, part of that is because people have realized the importance of user experience, knowing your audience to Chris's point, and the necessity of being able to adapt quickly and, and change messaging and change, you know, brands are constantly evolving. And previously, you know, I think it was more just about the technology and not the strategy as you, as you laid out. Yeah, I think like even in our own experience, when we were helping people improve sites each and every month, you know, we didn't have as much customer data to work off back in the days. You simply just didn't have the, the same mechanisms to gather customer data. So as um, the web has evolved, as technology has evolved, there's so much customer data at our disposal. And if you are not um, gathering that, you're not, not gleaming insights from it and, and adapting to it, then uh, you're going to lose out to the people who are. So it is, um, you know, it's exciting and it's also challenging. You know, there's just a very large landscape. Um, in the MarTech community, but uh, you can start small by, by stripping down your site to those bare essentials that you know you need, and then building on, um, going back to our, our guy at Toyota, building on the, the only, putting on only the stuff that matters to the customer. Everything else is a distraction. And have that clear funnel for someone to either gain access to that information that they want to find on your site or, or draw, bring them down the path of, of identifying themselves to you and you've added enough value where you can at least get their email address and remarket to them. And just Sam, last point on this, I would say to your question about, you know, beginning that process, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And since, you know, we see a lot of people now come to us through an RFP process or something like that, but they're willing to just take that stab at, at the user experience, doing some user journeys, figuring that audience out as its own initiative or project and then tackling you know a web design or migration to something else as a separate separate project entirely and so really breaking them up into two separate things instead of trying to do everything at once 
Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, even to this day, everyone has this vision of getting a 360 degree view of their customer. That's like, okay, we know everything that our customer or our prospect or our, our users do on the web, but very, very few people have that information. So organizations come to us with a lot of different levels of sophistication and regardless of where you might be, it's, it's about using what data you might already have on your user base or finding what might be the best approach to, to gathering it and then investigating, okay, well, we do have to make some assumptions in, in this, this first launchpad site, this MVP site that we're building because, um, and the way that we do that is through things like user stories. Like, okay, well, we know, and we talked to our users and we found out what they're hoping to accomplish on the web. So we're gonna try and build something that helps them accomplish that. Now we're not gonna optimize it and perfect it until we get enough people banging on that website and we see what exactly they need and we can adapt and improve it based on that feedback. First, our next question comes from Emily. She asks, how do I budget for a growth-driven design approach on my company's next website redesign? So good question. So I think I referred to this a little bit earlier where website budgets have always been kind of funny and they've always been based off of that old traditional project based model where a website is a project. It has a beginning and an end and it's going to cost you a fixed amount of money. Now, if, if, if you are doing your research, if your company is, is paying attention, <laughs> um, Everyone knows that the, the, the biggest investment that IT and the best investment that IT and marketing can make in the, in the client satisfaction is improving the customer experience. And, and the way that you do that is going to start with your website, which people often say is, is your best salesperson. And that budget, I think, needs to reallocate funds that come from, formerly came from marketing. So as, as Chris said, uh, the CMO is controlling more of the, the tech spend these days than, than the CTO used to in the past. So uh, the way people used to budget for a website, they'd ask their friends or their colleagues who were similar to them, and they would really just kind of pull out this number of what it should cost. Really, you should be invested in, okay, well, let's, let's go through the discovery period and start learning about our customers and then really figure out what we need to invest in the ongoing success of our site for the long term. So very long-winded answer to your question, but the, the, the website needs to be budgeted as part of, and every organization is going to be different. Some companies are simple, organizations are simply going to have to pull it out of an IT budget, but it really should have a fixed monthly investment as opposed to a, a fixed cost um, single investment every three years. And Emily, one other thing I would just add to that, that is the idea of an MVP or minimally viable product. And so that's something we're seeing a lot mm -hmm. more of now mm -hmm. is people being willing to say, okay, this is what I have to have mm -hmm. in that in that first iteration of the site. And then to Chris's point, they keep enhancing from there, but they know that it's not, they're not going from, you know, zero to 100 in that right. first set. They know that what they have to have and then everything else is stuff that they can tackle. Right. The, the old way of thinking is that we need to put up every bit of information ever produced about our, our company, our, our association, our organization. And if it's not on the website, then you know, we're gonna be missing it. Again, what is critical to your users? So only put up what is going to benefit them in some way, shape, or form. And then you add, adapt, and optimize based on you know, what they tell you over time. And, and when you do this, you don't get bogged down with content sprawl. You don't get these Frankenstein websites that are just patching on functionality that's not necessary. You get a much better user experience, much more streamlined content, and better results. Chris, your next question comes from Rachel, and she asked a great one, which is, what are the main differences between GDD, growth-driven design, and agile? Good question. I think, I think this could get confusing to people at some time. So, so agile methodology is, you know, it's a very, um, documented approach to, to web and software development. Uh, as I think I was trying to explain earlier, growth-driven design, or at least HubSpot's version of growth-driven design, is, is kind of a blend of 
both the lean approach that we talked about in manufacturing and, and agile methodologies that have been made popular by uh, software developers and, and Silicon Valley. So they are really um, kind of, GDG, if you think about it, is, is, a, is an application of some, some lean and agile methodologies. But really, it, our approach is there isn't one way to do things, and, and every client is different. Um, but we will certainly, um, we certainly have a very button-down process to the way that, that we do things here and what we'll work with our organization. Uh, next question comes from Andrew, and he asks, Chris, in your experience with using growth-driven design, is there any particular highlight or, you know, aha moment that happened for you during your career? You know, um, so for me, uh, the actual aha moment was when HubSpot used, <laughs> so this is a tool, but when HubSpot launched its CRM, I think in 2014, and I was working for an organization where we essentially when they did that, we were able to combine our sales and marketing data in one place. So if you think about what happens when you do that, as, as someone, you know, I'm director of growth and I'm also head up sales here at Unleashed Technologies. If I have information on um, not only like what activities or what in, how we've engaged prospective clients, um, through sales outreach, but also through marketing outreach, I now have a much better um, understanding of where the customer is in the buying process. So buyers nowadays come to the table with so much more information that you really need to be well aware of what information they've, they've already seen or, or where they are in the buying process or if they get frustrated with you really quickly. So the, this answer is that not only does marketing need to inform the adapt the adapting to the um the 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 data that you're getting from marketing but you need that sales feedback as well what is where are your sales being attributed to where is marketing has done their job but sales might have done have done theirs so that all works in conjunction so in my role growth driven design being offered offer sales feedback it really made a huge difference in empowering me as a salesperson Awesome, thanks, Chris. So at this point, I think we are through our questions. Um, if anyone has any more, the best way to reach out to us is by visiting our website, which is unleashed-technologies.com, or if you prefer just to email us, feel free to do that at start, S-T-A-R-T, at unleashed-technologies.com, and that will go to Chris and myself. We thank you for joining us today, and this recording will be sent out to everyone who attended today. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your time. Have a great weekend.